All right, I am Destin Sandlin, and I do a podcast here called No Dumb Questions with my good friend, Matthew Q. Whitman. How's it going, Matt? It is not, it is not a Q. It's super. I'm it's not spectacular. A what is it? No, nope, that was a great guess. Jay, you knew that. What is your middle name? Jason. Oh. Yours is Wilson. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, I didn't actually know. I think somebody's know. a little more invested in this relationship. <laughs> I didn't actually know your middle name. Like, you know, it, was, it wasn't frontal lobe. Wasn't in lizard brain. But you know my birthday. I do know your birthday. It's Christmas Day. That's pretty easy. See? All right. There we go. It evens out. All right. So I've got some stuff to update you with here, man. I am all ears. First of all, you know how we we have different things in our lives and we, we have different opinions. I switched back to iPhone. You did not. I did. What do you just hate? Joy? <laughs> I'm talking to you on an iPhone right now. Well, it sounds like garbage. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. No, I did. <laughs> I made that decision and I waited to tell you until we were recording because I just wanted to get your authentic reaction. And that's it, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Okay. Do you know what my real authentic reaction is? What's that? Ready for it? Yeah. Get ready. Three, two, one. Okay, man. Whatever's cool. I mean, whatever you like, it's fine. Well, I tried the Android thing for a while and I've decided that I like to be able to go back and forth. So the phone after this will probably be some form of Android because I like to be able to touch both types oh. of phones and do things on both platforms. Wow. So the phone thing means something to you. It does. It really does. It's a metaphor for the position you want to occupy in all of human existence. Yeah, I guess it is. I mean, people okay. have very strong opinions about what type of phone to use. Agreed. Which I think gets a touch ridiculous, but yes. I, yes, I think it do. does too. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I mean, what I would do is when I went back to iPhone, you know, on iMessage, if, if you're an iPhone user and someone texts you, then the text will come in as blue. And if you're an Android user texting an iPhone user, then the text will come in as green. And iPhone users can get pretty pretentious about this. They're like, oh my really? gosh. Oh yeah. Yeah. You didn't know this? No, but that's that's clever. That's actually kind of useful. Yeah. It Next is. thing you know, they're gonna put a headphone jack in their phones. So <laughs> <laughs> dang. Yeah, you're making good points. Yeah, so the way I, I I arrived at this decision is the reason I left iPhone to begin with is they took the headphone jack out and you don't have expandable memory. And I had those things over on the Android side, so I went over there. Then I realized that push bullet, which is the only way I have to text from my phone to my computer, mm -hmm. just wasn't cutting it for me. And you think that's an Android issue? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, there's not a global way to message other users or, you know, even cross platform. And it's 20, whatever it is, we're all cross platform users. We use laptops, we use tablets, we use phones. I mean, you're you're either communicating in the physical world or you're communicating in a digital world, and you need to be able to flow back and forth. And so I decided well, I'm just going to go back and do Apple for a while. Yeah, and push bullets okay, but mine is really hit and miss in terms of my ability to integrate and just bounce to text on the computer. Whereas I I do definitely understand the advantage of the iPhone universe that way. Yeah. And, you know, when you would send me a video or something, it would come in all garbled and stuff. That doesn't happen on the... Have you ever had an iPhone? No. I mean, I have one, but it, I don't use it. It's not connected to the network. Have you ever received a video on your on your Samsung or your whatever? And then you're yeah, sitting sure. there like, man, I can't, I can't really see what's going on here. This, it's so yeah, many... you don't text videos on... Well, I don't, I don't know if that works on an iPhone or not, but you don't text videos on Samsung Messenger. Okay, so that's the difference. You do on iPhone. You can send hmm. messages, and you can also do this thing called airdropping. For example, I'm going to tell you this place I went, and I hung out with Emily Grassley and Don Pettit. I like them both. Yeah, it's great. Lovely people. So we went and hu hung out, and while we were there... We took a bunch of pictures of all the stuff we were doing. And in the end, we just airdropped it to each other. Like, oh, you want these pictures? Here you go. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And we just airdropped it. So I'm back at iPhone for a while. Okay. Are we good? I'm cool with that. How long were you on? Of course we're good. How long were you on the Samsung? That was, uh, let me see, that was a year and a half ago. 
That was uh, March of a year and a half ago. March of last year, right? I think it was longer than that. I mean, I'm feeling like it was- I don't was... think so, because you got it, and then you broke the screen within, what, like a week? <laughs> it was it was pretty close. Yeah, yeah, and I was hanging out with you when you broke the screen, and I did not do it. It wasn't me. You just indiscriminately hurled it on the ground, and then it <laughs> broke. So yeah, it's been a year and a half. Let's see. When did the Galaxy S9 come out? Because that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, March 16th, 2018. Okay. Nailed it. I deserve a medal. (laughs) You do. You do, Matt. It's on the way. Yeah. Do you remember all the way back in conversation? I don't know when it was, but like 10, way back in the day, I was like, oh, I got a new phone. I got the Samsung Note 8. Remember that? I do. Yeah. And then I was like, you should get one of these because the Samsung thing is pretty cool. I still have that phone. That's the one you use? Yeah, it's still the one I use. I have it's, It hasn't even occurred to me to upgrade. Really? Well, what do new phones do that that one doesn't at this point? I mean, help me out. Seriously. Less? Yeah, it does less. And Samsung was like, you know what's great is taking away features everyone cherishes. Apple's killing it with that. We should do that too. So like the new Note, I don't think has a headphone jack or one of them doesn't. Well, what are they thinking? I'm with you. The, I'm right there with you. Limits so- my options. That is so dumb. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, it's like these tech companies don't sit and think about the, the way people work with their technology. The best companies sit around and think about what it's like for the people who use their product to use it. The companies that frustrate me sit around and think about how they want to socially engineer me toward the next thing. Right. Do you remember when all the companies figured out that it would be way better if we never owned their software? Oh, God. And like, like 10 years ago, the big push away from ownership and toward renting software. I hate that. You know, Don actually said that that's an issue on Space Station. Why? Yeah, he's like, sometimes when you have, like, for example, on Station, if you take a, a photo in RAW format, they have sure. issues where on the, the sensor itself, you get a cosmic ray that'll zap one of the pixels out. Yeah, and, it gets me all the time. And you just have like this red spot on your sensor. And he said, let's say, for example, you want to use some type of photo editing software and you want to hit that one pixel and, you know, just go ahead and make it whatever the adjacent pixel is before you do whatever on on station. Yeah, clone stamp. You can't do that. You know, if you own the software, you can do that. But if you're on the International Space Station, you can't just get updates whenever the software decides you need an update. You know? What is their internet like up there? Oh, this is fascinating. You know what we should do? I mean, I was about to go down the rabbit hole, and we talked about that. It's There's a satellite network called Tedris, and I don't know. Why don't we just have Don on sometime? Heck yeah. I think he'd do it. Don is delightful. He's awesome. Yeah, I think he'd do it. Do you think he'd talk about the uh, tyranny of the rocket equation with us? You know, that's... Okay, So so let's just... Catch the third chair up to speed here. So Don Pettit is my favorite astronaut. I like a lot of astronauts, but Don's a friend, right? And yeah. he he is unlike anyone I've ever met. For example, on the International Space Station, he was up there a long time ago on uh, ISS Expedition 6. And we've had a, a human in the space station for over 20 years. And Don was part of the first crew that helped assemble the space station. Wow. And... When he was up there, he was taking pictures of cities at night. Now, if you think about being here, looking up at the stars, you've got the stars zooming past you. You can't really tell until your exposure time gets up around a minute. You can start seeing star streaks and stuff stuff like that. But Don decided, I'm going to take pictures of cities at night, and you got these these streets that are illuminated by these lamps. And, you know, you've got these sodium vapor lamps and stuff like that. It's a real pretty color, you know, real warm color but occasionally you know you you try to get that photo and the international space station is going at 17,500 miles an hour and these cities are streaking under underneath you really fast way faster than the stars and so if you're going to zoom in and get that photo you have to pan the camera with the city you with me yep yep okay so don figured out well heck i'm trying to pan you know, pan the the really long lens with the city, and I'm I'm moving. I'm I'm kind of jittery and stuff like that, just because you know I'm in zero gravity. I don't really have a place to anchor and stuff. 
And so Don Pettit made a reverse telescope mount. It's called a barn door tracker. It's basically a hinge. And th they were going to send a vehicle back towards Earth to burn up in the atmosphere. And he's like, you know what? Before we take this vehicle and we shove it back to Earth, I'm going to steal some bolts off of it. And he did that. And then he found a drill on the space station. And he used this bolt, like a big, almost like a big thing of all thread. And he mounts a camera on it. And he's got a hinge on one side. And he hooks the drill up to this bolt. And so he's looking through an eyepiece with his eye. And he's got the drill in his left hand. And he's tracking and he's pulling the shutter button with a little release he's got in his other hand. And he's able to wait for it. Here comes Tokyo. Zzz, snap. Zzz, You're kidding. Zzz, snap. Take photos. Yeah, Don Pettit did that. On station with no plan whatsoever. He just gets there and he's like, you know what needs to happen? We need to make a reverse barn door tracker to look at the earth rather than look at the sky. Isn't that cool? Yes, that's cool. He's a space inventor. And he made this cup right over here that I've got next to me. But you can drink delicious tea and coffee in space. Oh, he sent you one, right? He sent me two. Did he really? Yeah. Well, the whole idea of the cup is that you need to have this because this is how humans connect with each other in space. And they were, you know, dripping hot coffee up their noses and it just didn't work right. And so he sent me two because he's like, one of these isn't the point. The point is human connection and connection with the real world and what makes us us. So you have to have two of them. So he sent me two. First of all, awesome that Don knows you well enough that he, he just mailed that to you? Yes, it was lovely. After we hung out at ThinkerCon. That's awesome. So do you know the, the magic behind that cup? The, the way it works? I'm quite sure I don't. So if you look at the cup on one side, it's an, it's an acute angle. And on the other side, you have the cavity to hold the, the liquid. Sure. And there's this thing with any fluid in a surface, it's called the wetting angle. And so the fluid will naturally go down into that, that angle point there, and that's where the fluid will, will stay. And the, the hole of the cup is big enough for your nose to slide into. So those little petals that you put your lips to, to drink out of that acute point on the cup, Don said, you know, this is the way people will drink liquids in the future if they choose to drink it in something other than a Capri Sun bag, which is what they're doing now. That was amazing. And he thought of that. Yeah, he thought about it on and station. Hundreds of years from now, when humans are exploring space and commercial space flight is something we're all totally accustomed to, and they're serving drinks on your way to wherever you're going, you'll be drinking out of a Pettit cup. Yeah. I think so. It'd be cool if they called it that. That'd be awesome. That's what it should be called. He thought of it. Why is the man not on? We, we should. Okay. In a future episode, let's just agree to get Don on. I think he would totally do that. I want to tell you about what I did recently. Okay. Don called me and he's like, hey, I'm going to go give a talk in Chicago. You're not going to be up there, are you? I was like, well, if you'll have me, I will go to Chicago just to hang out with you for a day. And he's like, sure. So I flew to Chicago and... He's given a talk at TEDx Naperville, which is a suburb outside of Chicago. Don gave a talk about pterosaurs. Like P.T. Pterosaurs. Yes. Okay, I remember those from books when I was a kid. Yeah, so I'm not going to explain the details of the talk because it will be released on the internet. But he gets up there and... They're like, oh, wow, okay, this is, you know, PhD, Don Pettit, he's an astronaut, what's he going to speak about? And everybody's thinking, like, the importance of space or, like, what we're doing to our climate or whatever. And he's like, I want to talk to you about pterosaurs. And I was like, oh, this is amazing, you know? <laughs> you, it was, it you, are, it was, you are very smitten with Don, but I have to agree, that subverts expectations and is interesting. So it, this was the way the argument goes, and I'm not going to give, I don't know, I might give away. So this is what he said. If, if you think about the history of the earth, there are clues to the way things were. You have, for example, the fossil record, and you have things like, well, you have the metabolic capacity of a muscle, you know, how much energy needs to be consumed by an animal in order for it to exert a certain amount of force and things like that. But there's one thing that we know, like we, we have an idea that the atmosphere was different because, you know, you look at Mars and Mars has a hundredth of the atmosphere of the earth. 
You look at mercury. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What is that? You mean just density? Yes. Thickness, that is? Yeah. So the Earth is one atmosphere. Okay. So Mars would be like 0.01 atmospheres, right? Okay. So we know that these rocky planets have different types of uh, pressures on them. Venus has a really dense atmosphere. Don said it was 100. I don't really know, but he said it was... I think he said it was 100 atmospheres. Maybe wrong about that. So we know that there are variations in what's possible. And right now, we have one atmosphere on Earth. And Don said, look, we know that there were these creatures that lived that apparently had the ability to fly. We also know through aerodynamic equations, we can figure out what it takes for one of these animals to fly in an atmosphere like ours, right? You can look at a bird, and you can look all the way up to a jumbo jet, and we know the drag and lift equations, and we can model and figure out what types of power are required to make certain types of flying things fly. You with me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they got this largest pterosaur. I forget the name of it. It's, it's just this gigantic one. There's, you know, pterodactyls is the one we all know, but there's this big one, and I'm going to butcher it, so I'm not even going to say it. He's... Pteranodon? No. No, it's something... I don't know what it is. Okay, so it's huge, but like what kind of huge? Give me a context. Um, It's not like 747, but it's, you know, way bigger than a human. It's gigantic. Like a uh, little personal plane like a little piper or something yeah yeah that's about okay. right so it's a gigantic thing oh wait here it is quetzalcoatlus oh that's a pretty sweet sounding name quetzalcoatlus Quetzal- sounds like the name of an aztec city q u e t z a l c o a t l u s all right it is one of the largest known flying animals of all time there's something larger i have no idea i'm sitting here looking okay. at a picture of it and the wingspan is 10 meters. Ooh. That's a third of a football field. That is a softball base path. Okay, so that's huge. So that's bigger than a little piper. That's several pipers, right? Long story short, he did the equations in this, this little presentation, and he was able to back out the atmospheric pressure of the planet at the time where this creature flew. That's exactly where I was hoping this was going. What was it? 3.2 atmospheres is what he came up with. How? Uh, okay. Oh, you know what? There's actually on Wikipedia, there is a picture of a comparison of a Quetzalcoatl and a, a Cessna 172. And the wingspan's about the same. So maybe the Piper estimation was about right. Okay. Well, yeah, a more familiar number for people would be a pitcher's mound to home plate. So, yeah. A little plane. It's huge. And a really, really, really big flying reptile. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, okay. So that's nuts. So what would three, what did you say? 3.2 atmospheres. 3.2 atmospheres. What would 3.2 atmospheres feel like on me? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Is there a corresponding level of like G-forces that you could compare it to? No, I don't know how. I mean- Because it's the same kind of thing, right? Like it's, it's an added weight. It's a pressure- but see, if, if the pressure in your body is equalized, you know, like the reason your ears pop and stuff like that is because you either rapidly decompress or you rapidly compress. Like when you're going sure. up a mountain, that's air or gas is trying to leave your body and they try to do it through your eardrums. When you're diving, for example, have you ever done the scuba diving thing? I have. So, you know, when you're going down in the water, sometimes the pressure feels like it's really great against your yeah. ears and you do the Valsalva trick where you pinch your nose and you blow. Yep. But that comes back to my question. When, I, when I'm when i a ways underwater, the weight of everything around me feels more substantial, even though I can equalize and get the pressure the same inside and out, there's still weight to it. And I would think triple the atmospheric weight, I would think that would have an effect and that you would notice it if you were in that environment, at least acutely. I, am I wrong? Well, I guess I do know. I mean, when you say it like that, I guess three atmospheres of water is, what is that in water depth? 
hold on, let me do the, oh, there, there's actually an equation for this, and I have a calculator right here. I knew there'd be an equation for it if I just pushed you long enough. So the equation for pressure is gamma Z, or you could say rho G H. Oh, wow, I can do this math. So rho of water, density of water, wow, is 997, 997 kilograms per meter cube. G, of course, is, you know this one. What's G? I don't know what G is. 9.8 meters oh, per second Oh, like meters square. per second squared. Like it's, yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So G is gravity. Yeah. Okay, I'm and catching then, on. Yeah, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to solve for 3.2 atmospheres. 3.2 atmospheres, multiply that times 101.325 pascals. That's one atmosphere in pascals. Okay. So... This is weird, man. I can actually do this math. 101, 325 times 3.2. So I want 324 kilopascals. And I just divide that out. Wow, we got there. What'd you come up with? So I got 33.1852. You know it might be fun? It might be fun to just um, let people check the math and see if the third chair can solve it. Yeah. I'm not smart enough to check your math, but I don't care how big your wings are. Oxygen, as I understand oxygen, or rather just air, as I understand air, I don't think anything is getting off the ground under that kind of pressure. It would be easier to fly because you would have more lift. You with me? So like stick your hands out right now and flap and you can feel the air that you're pushing. Like imagine there's more air there. I'm literally flapping. Yeah, it's it, you would get cl- like in water you can swim, right? So is that relationship static though? Because wouldn't it feel like you weighed more also? No, I mean a fish doesn't feel like it's No, no you wouldn't weigh more. You'd weigh the same. So you wouldn't feel that pressure or resistance at all. You would feel more drag as you moved through the air, but your flap would be more efficient. In fact, that was the problem. So what Don had to do is he had to take a curve that he created of the metabolic nature of animals. Okay. And he had another curve that is the power required to fly. And he's like, look, if we sit here and we look at the Quetzalcoatl, we can see that it's just not going to work. So we got to like tilt that thing over until the Quetzalcoatl can fly. We tilt one curve down to meet the other curve until it can fly, and it just happened to be at 3.2 atmospheres. So it was a genius presentation he gave. So obviously mass is still static, regardless of the amount of atmospheres you are under. Right. And obviously gravity isn't changing. So it really is just a matter of resistance. And if you had wings that were built the right way, like paddling a canoe through a slurry as opposed to crystal clear water. Yeah. You would get more pull in the slurry, but then doesn't your boat also still have to power through the slurry? So wouldn't that offset? Well, you're looking at the difference between lift and drag. That's what you're looking at right now. And so we understand that drag is when you're moving for like your car, for example, when you're moving down the road in your car, and you give it more gas, you accelerate, why do you reach a point where you can't go any faster? W- what causes that? The guy in front of me. There's that. And then? The, the cop behind let's, me. Let's say you pass him. <laughs> Come on, man. I feel like I'm not understanding the exercise. Uh, yeah. Why can't I go any faster? Right. Why do well, you I don't hit- know, the mechanical limits of my vehicle? No, it's the drag in the air. So in a vacuum, you're telling me that both of these vehicles would have the same maximum velocity? Yeah, it's possible, it, depending on the gear ratios and the power from, yeah, yeah. The acceleration would be different. Well, the gear ratios and the power, like that's that's the whole reason for the question is that mechanically they're different things. Not necessarily. So I, I would feel like there would be some sort of top end limit that you would reach more quickly on a flat surface in a vacuum with a geometro. It, somehow just we're eliminating drag with the tires here as well. I, I don't know how we'd do that, but just imagine there's no friction factor here either. Right. So Yeah, but I mean, for example, if you think about the, uh, this is a really good question. So or it's not a dumb question. Let's put it that way. Thank you. So if, if you can imagine. That is kind of a downgrade from really good to, well, at least not dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's at least not a dumb question. So if you think about how your Geo Metro is designed, it's designed to have um, you know, you're you're going to operate that at like a thousand RPM on the engine, right? Sure. The idea there is fuel efficiency. 
Whereas if you have like a race car, uh, like an F1, you want to be able to accelerate really fast. So you're going to just ramp up the RPMs on the engine and your gears are going to be shorter, meaning you're going to go through the torque optimum spot, if you will, for that particular engine quicker. But on the Geo Metro, if you're going to go, you know, you're moving along, that gear is really long. (laughs) There's a lot left in that. So I guess in theory, if you had the same size engine, you would probably want, if we were just going like on, on the salt flats or something in a perfect vacuum, you'd probably want to go with the Metro or something like it. You know, then you have to issues of the tires flying apart because of rotational forces. But anyway, it's yeah, but really, we're eliminating all of that. Yeah, it's a fun thought experiment. I think you would want to go with taller gears. You'd want to go with gears that would let you just like, you know, ramp up the engine slowly, but you know, you'd get there. You wouldn't accelerate fast, but you could keep on accelerating. It's really fun to picture the two of us in a sea green Geo Metro running on one cylinder through space. Bumping <laughs> Dr. Feelgood and Pump Up the Jam and all the other hits of 1989 or whatever it, it was when those were on the road. Yeah, just <laughs> off into nowhere. It's some metaphor for something. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for playing along. I don't know how we got here, but it was fun. <laughs> well, okay, how we got here is I'm trying to understand how the Quaxadexadacadugal... Quetzalcoatl. That's what I said. Why are you like this? That's yeah. how it would have functioned. I want to understand how the thing would have functioned with this 3.2 atmospheres instead of one. And I, and I guess I'm still just not understanding the upside or downside of more atmospheres or less atmospheres as it pertains to manual, mechanical, not rocket propelled flight. Yeah. The closer to water you get, the more closely flight starts to resemble swimming. I guess that's one way to say it. So Ooh. you can't you can't swim very fast because you've got all that water in front of you, the drag, right? But you don't sink either. That's right. And so you've got a really good lift coefficient, but you got a lot of drag. So the Quetzalcoatl might not have flown as fast. You know, it's not going to be like a huh. an Osprey or a the Peregrine Falcon on a dive or anything like that, but it, it would probably be more efficient in its flight. You know what's interesting is when I'm having a dream that obviously isn't cluttered by shadow monsters, but when I'm having a dream that's pleasant and I'm flying, it is far more like swimming because I I think my subconscious brain can't fathom flight like Iron Man flight. Yeah. And so it's always just this controlled, I'm feeling lighter and lighter and I can just barely be off the ground. And then it's almost like my intuitive lizard brain knows that that is how flight with greater atmospheres would work because that's what I do in my dreams. It's very slow. It's very controlled. And I can just kind of push against the air to move through it. And I hate it when I wake up from those, dude. I do too, man. I mastered flight. No, I'm not. I'm here in this bed. (laughs) I know the feeling, man, when you're in a good dream. I'm listening to that same stupid alarm again. Crushing (laughs) disappointment. No, that that's fascinating to me. Did Don talk about that? Like, this is what it might have looked like when an animal like this flew around? No. He, I mean, the way he ended his presentation was good. And I'm going to wait because this is going to be on the internet. I know TEDx Naperville is going to put this up and it is okay. totally worth yeah. the watch. Yeah. All right. We won't great. ruin Don's thing. But you did a yeah. really good job of making me interested. I don't know if anybody's ever told you this. You do a really good job of communicating things about science and engineering. Thanks, man. You do a good job of making people who shouldn't be interested, interested. I mean, you should think about this more. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm here to help. This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, you can get easy, seasonable recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. It is so simple. My dad can do it. (laughs) (laughs) Both a compliment to HelloFresh and a slight jab at your dad. (laughs) Well, dad and I, we decided to make these tacos together the other day. And uh, I asked mom, I said, hey, mom, when's the last time that dad cooked for you? And she's like, well, he cooks two things. He cooks macaroni and hot dogs. Oh. And it's been a really long time, 30 years. And so dad and I went to the kitchen and we made carnita tacos together and mom loved them and it was a total win for the entire family that's how simple it is it's great so to review your dad in his memorable lifetime has made hot dogs macaroni and cheese and carnita tacos (laughs) 
he's probably the only person ever who could say that those are the three things he's ever made. I mean, these tacos were great. And the thing I really enjoyed was making it with dad. It was fun. We just kind of hung out and cooked together. It was really fun. Yeah. I also like not going to the grocery store and bumbling around trying to figure out what I'm... I could with enough time, but theoretically... I could not in a reasonable amount of time figure out how to go to the store and acquire the things I need to make carnita tacos. HelloFresh is my only hope. Yeah, exactly. And so dad and I started and he's like, I don't know how to, I said, dad, come on, you've worked on spacecraft. You can do that. He's like, you're right. Let's do it. And we did it. Oh. And it was fun. It was great. So here's the deal. Um, if you want nine free meals with HelloFresh, you can get that by going to HelloFresh.com slash ndq9 and using the promo code ndq9 at checkout nine free meals that's a lot uh yeah that's a lot of food hellofresh.com slash ndq9 promo code ndq9 and there's all kinds of other things about hellofresh it's flexible you can pause it if you have to leave for the week or something like that it's built around your life and it's going to let you have dinner around the table with family and connect. It's a great thing. Yeah. And if it's been a while since you've done this, now they've got little bonus stuff on the side. You get cookie dough and garlic bread and all of that. And it's fantastic. I've had it. It's awesome. So there it is. HelloFresh.com slash NDQ9 and use the code NDQ9 at checkout. Thanks again to HelloFresh for being a friend of the program. And let's get back to the conversation. So there's some other stuff that happened in uh, Naperville. There was an after party and uh, <laughs> may or may not have involved Don Pettit, Emily Grassley, and I going to Home Depot and constructing a, uh, a didgeridoo from uh, <laughs> implements we found at Home Depot. It was amazing. Um, you, your people have different kinds of after parties than my people. <laughs> We, we actually performed on stage with it. It was very interesting. What? Anyway. What stage? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. You don't gloss over that crap. Where was yeah, there was a stage all... that people wanted to see you three playing an impromptu primitive didgeridoo that you made at Home Depot? Well, it was me and Don doing it, and it was uh, it was just an after party they had, and they said, we're going to have an after party with no entertainment, so we're the entertainment. So bring something you can play or do, and we'll do it. And Don does this thing where he makes didgeridoos. Of course he does. It naturally. Why didn't I just know that? That's for another time, though. Let me let me tell you what happened after the after party. So something really interesting happened on the way back to the airport in Chicago. And it was kind of a, an important moment for me. 6 a.m., I wake up. Well, I woke up at 5.30. get downstairs to hop in my cab at 6 o'clock, and the guy's there. He's got his name on his cab. And I say, sir, can I run inside and check out of the room real quick? He's like, yeah, buddy, take your time, whatever you want. And I was like, man, that's, that's a really nice guy. Hmm, okay, I'll go do that. So I went and checked out, came back, and you get in the cab or the Uber or whatever you're in, right? And there's always that weird moment. You're like, what is this car ride going to be like? Uh, yeah, and you decide in the first 15 seconds if you're going to chit-chat or if you are going to gawk at your phone. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I was tired Tired to the point where I couldn't think. I had slept about three hours or something like that. Don and I talked at the after party, and then we probably went to bed around one o'clock or something like that. But anyway, long story short, no sleep. So I was like, man, I, I just don't feel like talking to this guy. You know, he seems like a real nice guy, but I'm just tired. It's a 40-minute drive to the airport. I think I'm just going to fall asleep. And so I said, hey, man, you can turn on any music you want to. You know, I know a lot of times when people ride in cars, you feel like you have to keep your music off. Go for it. Whatever you want to play, do it. He's like, are you sure? I was like, yeah. He goes, okay, I'm going to play some Nigerian music. I said, bring it. I was like, my sister was in the Peace Corps in West Africa. I love that music. Let's go for it. And he played this really good song. I don't know the name of it. I'll have to go back and try to find it. It was this very repetitive clearly some old guys singing and I didn't know, I don't know. I didn't know what it was. And finally I just couldn't take it anymore. I was closing my eyes and drifting off to sleep, but I just really enjoyed the music. And I said, after the music went down, I said, sir, can you tell me what that song was? That was amazing. And he said, Oh, that was Nigerian wedding music hmm. from 1975. Hmm. And he told me the name of the band. And I said, what, what language was that? And he told me the language. And I said, are you from Nigeria? Yes, I am. I said, well, what, what were they singing about? Because I could, I could feel what they were feeling, but I don't know the language. But I, I could tell that it was a plea for something. What, what, what is it? 
And he said, oh, well, um, you sure you want to know? I was like, bring it. He said, it's about getting young people to question what they're doing in the world. I said, okay, in what way? He said, for example, and he said the phrase that I don't remember, Baba Da or whatever it was. I bet that was it. He said, that phrase means, do you own the world? Whoa. And I said, I don't understand. I'm sorry. And he said, what he's doing is he is going around, the singer is going around to different people and saying, do you own the world? Are you in charge of the world? You know, who, who is in charge of the world? And they could not find a person that was over everything. So they would go up to the president and they'd say, do you own the world? He'd say, no, I don't own the world. Well, who does own the world? And this was the question. And there was no like religious punchline or anything like that. He was saying, then if we're all in this together, we need to think about what we're doing. Think about what you're going to do with your life and apply it. And for a 6 a.m. groggy destin, it was a deep philosophical thing, and I found it to be very interesting. I sent you the recording. Did you did you listen to the recording of this guy that I sent you? Yes, I did. Completely out of context. And it was fascinating. And and before you tell me more about the recording, just what a fascinating concept. He's talking about Nigeria. He's talking about stuff written in 1975. The world's a lot different now than it was in 1975 in terms of the level of connectedness between the West and, say, West Africa. Right. And here's this concept, uh, trying to get a kid to understand you own the world. I remember we talked about Willow the other day and the high Aldwin, Nelwyn, whatever his thing's called. Billy Barty is trying to get Willow to pick his own finger. Which finger has the power to change the world? And Willow didn't have the courage to say, it's my own finger. And that was like his growth curve lesson for his life. So you got that concept that I felt like was an extension of this Jeffersonian idea that Jefferson and Madison kicked around. And you've heard the quote, it's the earth belongs to the living. And Hmm. they discussed this idea in the concept of how you design a country, how you design a constitution so that future generations aren't just beholden to whatever the fights or problems were of a previous generation, that whatever system you build needs to be amendable and tweakable and and not, you know, permanently etched in stone. And and maybe I'm overstating it, but I'm summarizing at least one of the arguments uh, in that discussion that they had. And so you're telling me about this and I'm saying quiet because I want to hear the story, but I'm also fidgeting. But look at this, separate worlds. And here people are coming to the same conclusion that one of the big hurdles in youth is figuring out that the world is shapeable, that you have agency and ownership with what your life looks like and what the world around you looks like. And not just in like, hey, go out and protest and change the world kind of a sense, but in the personal existential kind of a sense. And so I'm I'm moved by that and I'm intrigued from the get go. And I didn't know that when I listened to this recording. Listen to this guy talk. There was some moment in the conversation where I realized I am not in the presence of a normal man. Hmm. I am in the presence of a man who has experienced things that I will never understand. He has experienced different types of uh, segregation like uh, socioeconomic, like he's an immigrant. He's from Nigeria. He's come to America. He started working here. Like this man has seen and experienced things that I will never understand. You know, I was born a white person in the South. My parents had an opportunity to work at a plant and send me to school. And that, that was a big deal. And I went to school and, you know, became an engineer And other people don't have opportunities like that. Nor hurdles, because there are hurdles that come with that upbringing too. There are. It's just a a different, a very different set of circumstances, but with some really amazing upside too. Yeah. But I mean, here we are, there's there's two men. There's this, this white Southerner in the back seat, and there's this black Nigerian guy in the front seat. He's an American. And we're sitting there and we're talking and we're connecting on an incredibly deep level. It was fascinating. And at some point, I was like, "He's recording me." So, so he, he's got a, uh, you know, he's got one of these cameras in the car where he's pointing it back, and you know, just to make sure the people in the cab doesn't freak out or whatever. So I felt okay turning on my audio recorder, and I was like, "There is wisdom here that I will forget if I don't record this." So I'm going to roll. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of like road noise here. But I want to play you just a little bit of what this guy said and the life that he's lived and the honesty and earnestness with which he communicates that stuff. You did listen to it, right? I did. It's 
incredible. It's worth every second. Is it really? Okay. I'll vouch. I was riveted. I, I set everything aside after about a minute of listening and felt the same thing. I need to shut up, put aside distractions and drink this in. I don't know. How do you want to do this then? So I was thinking we could just leave the whole audio over for the patrons. We just put it up on Patreon or something. No, just or? play the whole dang thing here. Just play it right here? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, everything. Let people hear it. Okay. Let's do it. And so um, I guess we'll just play it and you know, just talk about it after. Perfect. When I start the conversation, just understand that we started talking about divisiveness in society. I said something about how divided American culture is. And he responded by saying, no, you're wrong. Here we go. You can bump the president. Ooh, you do that in Africa, shit. <laughs> Everybody will go to jail. <laughs> really? Yeah, in Nigeria. Come on, man. You got freedom here for it. Real yeah. freedom. How long have you lived here? I came here in 1981. Do you feel freedom here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know what the freedom is all about. If you live in both ways, because I was 16 years the time I came in here. I was 16. So I have experienced both countries. So even though there's a lot of fighting here, you still think it's better? Fighting where? Like people fight with each other. Yeah, in US? Yeah, in politics. No, there was no fighting here. This is like a, this is like heaven. Really? If you want to fight, go to Africa, go to my country. It will last two years. You'll be gone. There's no fighting going on here. Huh. This is like heaven, honestly. Really? Shit. You know, the only way you can judge anything is when you see the both side of it. Even the coins, he has front and back, head and tail. Those who criticize America, if you go to another country, it wouldn't even last five one week you'll be I said, man, let me go back home. <laughs> I swear to God. When's the last time you went home to Nigeria? I went home the last two years because I'm building a house where my kids going to come back for the first time. My first son is captain in the U.S. Army. And my second son is an engineer. They haven't been home yet. So I'm planning for us, three of us, to go home because the other one is still in college. For the first time, you know. The first, my first son is in South Carolina. In a military, military um, Paris school. Island? Huh? Paris Island, South Carolina? Uh, no, 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 it's a uh, school. Yeah. Military office, a military, yeah. military school. Yes. Yeah, he's a lecturer there. So he's, he's a captain? Yeah, he's a captain. Wow. This is it's on my Facebook here. So, you know, I went to USC, University of South Carolina. Right. So uh, that's where I met your mama. My mama is a medical doctor now. The mama. So yeah. I left and came back here. I'm supposed to be a lecturer, but I choose this because I have, I have my own family in Nigeria. They need money almost every day. Every day. So you're, <laughs> you're working to send money home? Working to send money home. Taking care of the kids, but now the kids are taking care of me. So I've, I, 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 this is my home. This is my home. Yeah. When I go home in Africa, Nigeria is the most corrupted country in Africa by far. More than the Congo or Sudan? By far. You know, when I say by far, it's like uh, the distance is like that. That's gone hundred percent, and the second is like sixty-five. Really. <laughs> Really? Nigeria is the worst of the worst. So they make you uh, they make you pay a bribe to leave and things like that. The corruption I'm talking about is the advanced one. They are the combination of corruption, mean, nasty, greedy, all those things combined in one. And heartless. You know what we mean by heartless? No. When your brother, the same father, the same mother, will arrange a arm robber to come out. A robber? Rob oh, an him. ambush. I'm robber. Yeah. Ambush you. And get the money and split it with him. Wow. Those kind of hard, hardcore. So when I go home, I don't have fun. Because you are targeted. And you don't know. You don't you don't you don't trust nobody. You don't trust nobody. 
If that's why I, I'm so reluctant to take my kids home. Because the worst person, worst thing to do in this world is to read somebody's mind. You know what I mean? I don't know what you're thinking because I haven't been inside you. No, so, so you're saying it's hard to understand what other people are thinking? Because they're mean. Okay. They are extremely mean. They are greedy. They are mean. They are greedy. They are jealous because you went to America and study. So ah. like, yeah, everything is a combination of one. So they might be laughing at you. Wah, 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 wah. You never know what is their heart. I came back here last time. I went home two years ago. Came back here. I went to Coe County, Co County Hospital, the one of the big, uh, biggest hospitals in South Chicago, down there for the for the minority. I went over there, spent three days because they poisoned my food, and I didn't go outside. They poisoned they, your food in yes, Nigeria. Yes, they put chemicals in my food, and I ate it. You know, like rat chemicals. Stuff. Why did but, they poison your food? Jealousy, combination of jealousy. You went to America, you don't, you don't take care of. You give everybody money. You don't want to give me money. A lot of little, little things that you think that is not. Your mind is different from others. Do you understand what I'm saying? My, mind, my, my mind is different than it's others. It's different from others. Maybe you are raised from going to church. Today is Sunday. Maybe you are raised in the environment where you have to love each other. Yeah. Maybe you are raised where every day you call your brother or your brother call you back or your sister call you back and check up on each other. Your environment, the way you raise, determine how you think in future. Yes. And how you reason in yes. future. If you are me, you me. Period. My family is full of me. Your fa me. So your family poisoned you? My family. I didn't go out. I only spent five days in my family. The, same, back here. the same family that you're sending money to? The same family. My junior brother. My junior brother. To be exact. And he, after he confessed. He confessed he did it. Because I, I, I went to abroad and I studied and done everything. Everything went smooth for me. And I forget about him. That's, that's his reason. And he doesn't even know. Yeah, in abroad, he will have to walk a bottle. The money doesn't grow on tree. Wow. He put shit on my food. I don't even know. And find out it was a rat killer. Those two, that person that they put in the rat, the rat will eat and die. And the only thing that saved my life, I spent only five days. Because I don't know nothing about it until I came in back here and uh, everything started went, went off. Uh, my system was shutting down, everything was shutting down. They rushed me to the hospital. So what I'm saying is that Nigeria is the best, is the top of the top. So if you were in my own shoe, will you be excited to go back home again? Never. <laughs> Never. Will you be excited to take your kids to go, go home? Yeah. No. You won't be excited no more. You know, it's, 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 sad. it's sad. That my is sad. wife, my wife, because I had an American wife when we were in college, the one that has two kids for me. Yeah. So when we grow, we, we grow apart. So now she married a different. I went back and get a wife from Nigeria, right? Although she's, she don't have no baby, but we live together now. Their own family, their own family is a very loving family. I get jealous because every day she calls her sister from US to Nigeria and check up on her sister. And the brother call, they check up on each other, they laugh. You know, they come and yeah. they laugh. And when I see them laugh, it makes me jealous. That you don't that you don't have a don't connection have with your family. Kind of like family. This. I don't have that kind of family. She is your family. Uh, she is, but I wish I could have my own family. My brothers and my sister be calling me instead of asking me how much I'm going to send. Have you sent money yet? And I would say, look, I haven't even paid my house rent. How much more sending you? Then uh, they will end up in cussing me out. You've been here almost 30 years. You don't want to, 40 years, or uh, going to 40 years, and you don't want to take care of us. It's like uh, you own everybody money. Do you send money to the brother that tried to poison you? Uh, yes, I took care of him. Still? He went He went to uh, Germany. 
This you, guy, I train him. I want him to go to Germany because he said he want to go to Germany. I walk my butt up because I don't want to be a teacher. Teachers is after, after they pay you every two weeks or whatever. But this one is he get money every day because they worry me all the time. So I raise money, borrow money from the bank, send him to Germany just to go there and see whether he can do a manual level to raise himself because he refused to go to school. He went over there and started doing drugs. He was locked up for seven years. I get my, I get my, my friends in, uh, in Germany, same money there, and they brought, brought him back to Nigeria. He's the one that puzzled me. So you're not going to send him money? No, 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 okay. no, no. Screw that guy. No, <laughs> no, I don't even talk to him no more. Yeah, yeah. he tried to kill you. He tried to kill me, and he confessed. What about the rest of your family? Are they okay? Uh, they're all right because he can, I don't trust nobody now. He can blame me. I can't even eat my family right now when I go home. I'm going to eat. The last time I ate, it was very close for me to die. You know what? You do have family. Yeah. Here in, Amer here in America. I'm in America. Well, well, I mean, like, like America is your family. Yeah. It's, I have my sons here. My, my, I, have, I have my wife here. I have everything here. But there are those extended family. But I mean, like me and you. Yeah. Like I'm we're, white, you're black. Yeah. We're but we're Americans now. We're family. We're family. That's right. God damn it, we're family. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are you talking about? We're family. That's right, she, buddy. Yeah. You remember that Diane, the priest Diane, the one that died of motor accident from London? Yes. Diana. Yes. Diana. Princess, Princess Diana. Yes. yes. Do you know what killer? Lack of love. So love is very important. Lack of love. She wasn't loved. That's why she looking love everywhere. Yeah. And find herself dead. Yeah. She wasn't loved. That love, L-O-V-E, is very, very important. What's the name of the... I agree with you. What's the... I want to I wanna listen to that band again. That band that you... Well, like, well, what is the Google name? Google it. Google it. I'm going give to you, give, you, give you the name. Orenta, right? Orenta Brothers. Orenta Brothers? Yeah, Orenta. O R E N T A? Yeah. So, oh. Brothers. Orenta Brothers. International. Okay. Then it, the only way you can find it is that you Google Nigerian music. Okay. Under Nigerian music, it's the Orenta Brothers. They got thousands of records. What is the name of that song that we were listening to? The. the well, Warrior, 1975. Warrior, 1975. Yes. Dude, it's a good song. Yeah, it's, it's very popular. And they play it when, when people are wedding. So you're going to get, get drunk and start jumping up and down. <laughs> <laughs> you get drunk and start jumping up and down? Yeah, that's the purpose. So, so if you don't have love in your family, you know that you are in trouble. Because I don't have one. And it's so sad. So sad. I'm sorry your brother tried to poison you. Man, I... this guy, he can never satisfy him. He's so jealous. You know that Cain and Abel, Abel type in, in, in Bible? Yeah, Cain and Abel. Yeah, those are the kind. Well, he, the brother, he just, it's so sad. I'm about to cry now. You, you about to cry? I'm very emotional right now. Why are you emotional? Because he, love is the most important thing. Anything you are doing. Oh, man. Thanks Thank for the you. tip, buddy. God bless you, man. And you, buddy. Thank you, sir. It was nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. And uh, I'm glad you're part of the American family now. Yeah, you do. That's my family, man. That is your family. Later, brother. Hold right on, my brother. Well, that was amazing. His family's America now. That was awesome. So, yeah, man. That's a, That was an incredible conversation. I kind of don't know where to start in terms of processing that. Can we just pick some things and talk about them? Yeah, I, I want to hone in on one thing specifically. So It's your story. You take the lead. What's that? Well, the thing that melted my brain is that in his society, he came to America to work, and he's sending money back home. He's just working really, really hard, and when he gets there to visit his family, he's there for five days or whatever it was, somebody in his family is so jealous of his opportunities that they poisoned him. Yeah, about that. 
I talked to Tara last night. And I was like, yeah, she listened to it. She said, oh, that's arsenic. I said, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, yeah, arsenic makes the organs shut down. They poisoned him, Matt. Wow. And you can, you can hear the pain, the emotional pain in his voice because he feel like he, he, he lost his family in that moment because right. he can't trust his own family. But he's still, he's still working to send money back to him because he loves him. I will never know hardship like that. I hope I will never know that. But the man's laughing and smiling, and he's, he's being kind to me, and he's, he's taking the time to, to make me see how good it is here. You know what I mean? Like, he could just get bitter. He really wanted you to understand that. He did. That he was not going to suffer for one minute you saying, people fight here. I mean, he, he was polite, but no, they do not, and you don't know what fighting is. That's my paraphrase of what he said to you. Yeah, he schooled me, man. He absolutely schooled me. And I needed to hear every second of it. Another thing that I thought was interesting is he was talking about his new wife and how she has family that she can call and interact with. And he wants that. I'm like, but yeah, she's your family. Yeah, 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 she's my family. But like, I want my family. Wasn't that interesting? You used the right word earlier. It is just heartbreaking. When he likened it to Cain and Abel. And the thing I remember about hearing that story for the first time as a kid in Sunday school or whatever was just the level of betrayal. Then back then I had a brother and now I don't because he's passed away. But even then just thinking, I just can't imagine one or the other of us doing something like that. We have a unique bond. I mean, we're, we're a family. Yeah. I, I was tempted at the beginning of the conversation in my brain to get on a soapbox alongside him and be like, yeah. There are big political points that we need to make here, and probably some of them need to be libertarian. And then as it went along a little further, I got much more connected with the human side and thought, no, I don't need to make observations about anything. They're going to be half-baked because I never had my brother try to poison me to death. Look, if somebody wants to read any political narrative or anything into what he said to be like, see there, that my thing is right and your thing is stupid, there's a way to do it. In fact, I could probably run the mental exercise from any political perspective just off the top of my head sitting right here. It's not hard to weaponize stories for your purposes. So I don't want to do it because I think it's incomplete. But more so, I just heard for him. You're half a world away from what you know. You like where you are now. I mean, that, that guy's going to have a divided life forever. An immigrant life, a half here, half there, divided lingua franca from heart language and You'd expect someone like that to have a story of enormous sorrow and want to share that sorrow with you and for you to participate in it. But that's not why he told you. Yeah. He didn't tell you that to make you sad or feel bad for him. I don't think. Why do you think he told me? Uh, That's what I was leaving it there for you to answer because you were in the room. (laughs) So I want you to answer that. I can say this much. I don't think he told you because he wanted to score points about his hard life or make you feel bad for him. I think he told you for some other reason. I'll go that far. Why do you think he told you? I think he told me because he thought that telling me would make the world better. I don't know why or how. I mean, he doesn't know this podcast exists. He doesn't know that thousands of people will hear this. I don't know, man. He was making a single investment in a single heart for a single reason. I just don't know what that reason was. I think he wanted me to understand, like, hey, man, you want all these people to be fighting. You just don't understand. They're not. You're more unified than you think. I think he wanted you to know that you have it better than you might otherwise think. That's my guess. Perspective. I've told you about the fancy Google meeting, right? This is not the gold jacket monocle blimping club. This is the gold jacket monocle blimping. Everybody gets their own private lemur and each lemur has a personal masseuse for the entire time club. Yes, it's so much better. Yeah, so I I went to this meeting. (laughs) I went to this meeting called Google Zeitgeist. I was invited. It was a huge honor. The people that are in this room are some of the most influential people in the world. I read the guest list. It's staggering. Staggering. It is not an exaggeration. We're talking about a small room, about 200 people-ish in the room, and like the speakers like Michelle Obama, Paul Ryan, the guy that advises Bill Gates on what to do with his money, like pe- people like that. And I'm sitting there thinking holy cow, I'm so fortunate to be in here just here. You know, Katie Couric is interviewing unbelievable people and they're just talking about what can we do to influence the world for good. And there were a lot of really interesting things said in that room. 
But the one thing that is just like burned on my soul that was said in that room was from Michelle Obama. She said, it's hard to hate up close. Well put. You understand the, it's hard to hate up close. That's the Christian principle of praying for your enemies. Whether you think God actually tangibly responds to or hears prayer at all, whether you think there's a God or not, that teaching of Jesus to pray for your enemies and bless those who persecute you, even if there's no deity behind it, and I think there is, it still changes you. You can't pray for your enemy and continue to think of them in the same way you thought of them before. Right. The other thing is it helps you take that step towards them and learn what they're about. I grew up in a place where a lot of people said really bad things about immigrants and made laws so certain people couldn't work at certain places because they would take the jobs and stuff like that. It's one thing to think those things and another thing to pass those laws, but until you've sat in a cab on the way to the airport in Chicago and you've heard the life that this man has led and understand the good that he's trying to do, you don't really understand what's going on. There's economic pressures at play, of course. There's global politics at play. But at the end of the day, there's a man trying to make money to send it to his family, and he, he's worked up to the point where he owns his own car. Things like this have changed me over the past two years. Honest, sincere interactions with immigrants. My brother-in-law, for example. Yeah. We're brothers. Yeah, we greet each other with a hug all the time. I don't know, man. I'm changing. My heart's changing. I'm not saying I ever felt negative things towards immigrants at all, but things like this interaction with this gentleman. I don't know if you heard there when we declared each other's family. Oh, yeah, I heard it. That was him leaning his car his car seat back, coming back to the back seat. I was in the back seat. Coming back to the back seat and high-fiving me and giving me one of those high-fives where you grab each other's hands and you hold it like a hand hug. Yeah. Yeah, we're brothers. Camilla has taught English as a second language to adults for a long time. That's something that she wanted to do because she feels the same softness that this encounter engendered in you. And she's always really at a soft spot for people who can't speak the language, can't imagine what it would be like to come here figure out how to navigate the business world and pay your bills and do all the stuff that you need to do government wise and function socially and religiously and not have you know, functional use of the language. So what's something really practical that a person who speaks English could do to serve somebody who doesn't and who's here and is a new neighbor, well, teach them how to speak the language and get around, take them under your wing. And she's doing that again right now. She just took on a a lady in her 60s who is in Rapid City and they get together and Camilla teaches her English. That's how she's wired. Well, there was one student like this. It was a tough deal. Her mom needed money to be sent back home. And so she put her in the back of a semi truck and sent her across several countries. I'm being a little bit intentionally vague. And this young lady who was a teenager ended up getting caught spending a bunch of time in a border security detention center. Eventually, somehow, was it that she got released on bail? That detail might not be quite right, but I think a family member, a cousin or something, vouched for her, and then the situation she ended up in was pretty ugly. There were some other family members or people living with family members who did some pretty bad stuff to her. And she didn't have the language skills, nor did she feel like she was here in a way that she could go to any authorities because you know, she'd overstayed her, her welcome, if you will. Or maybe she was just out and out here illegally. I can't remember. Can I pause you for just a second? So it's interesting when you tell this story to me right now, because this person that you're telling the story about in my head is a certain type of person. They're a certain ethnicity and they're from a certain place and they went in certain areas and across certain borders. Right. But when you say like she did this and her was that and all this stuff, I just see all that. It's, it's like a cloud of demographic information. But in your head right now, I can hear it in your voice because I know you well. There's a person there that you love. Yes. And you're telling the story 
on a completely different level than I'm hearing it because I've never met this individual. And you're hearing the story from me very guarded. I'm being thoughtful about a lot of parties in terms of how I'm telling it. I like to tell the story in a way that has all the heart, but I, I just can't because this conversation has an audience. So anyway, she got out of this detention center. Yeah. And then was in an awful living situation, has no option. What do you do if some people are doing really bad things to you habitually, but the people in society whose job it is to put their foot down and protect victims view you as an offender by your mere presence in a place? Well, that's a tough draw, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's not her fault she was here. A person she pretty much has to obey in a last ditch effort to keep things together, sent her this direction. She was, she was a kid. She couldn't say no. Not her fault she's here. She's just here. There's nowhere to, nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. And so my wife, who is a sensational person, wildly introspective, careful about what she even allows herself to think about others, feels guilt when she thinks stuff about others she shouldn't think. She's enormously introspective and careful about that. And one of the things I, I love about her the most is that she takes that seriously, even though nobody gets to know or really see that struggle. She knows it, it matters to what her soul is. She saw this situation happening with this young lady who was one of her students in a language class and knew why this young lady couldn't get help anywhere else. And so she asked if uh, this young lady could just have a room from us for no rent until she could figure something out. And our Spanish wasn't real great at that point. And this is basically the impetus behind us learning Spanish was, well, we have this guest here and we need to figure out uh, how to communicate and how to help. And Camilla just decided she was going to go to bat for this person and do absolutely everything she could uh, in terms of working with the law and trying to affect her situation. And um, she did. Ultimately, um, this young lady ended up back in her home country just a matter of weeks before she would have become a permanent resident here for certain reasons. And that's where you know she still is as, uh, as a friend to this day. So how long did she stay with you guys? I don't remember at this point. It was a good chunk of time. A year, maybe. Wow. That's a long time. So is that illegal? I don't know. I didn't ask. I didn't just call the government and be like, hey, is this the government? <laughs> hey, this is Matt Whitman. I live at this address. <laughs> hey, I had a question, no particular reason about whether something was allowed or not. No, I decided to go with the uh, ask forgiveness instead of permission approach on that one. Yeah. We ended up doing some stuff where we went to and participated in some pro bono legal seminars to try to help people in that situation and particularly this young lady and eventually a young man who was in the same situation and they were kind of in the situation together. And we tried, we tried really hard. I don't know how helpful we ultimately were, but I think they knew we cared about them. I'm interested in reaching out to people that aren't like me. Yes, you are. You are too, obviously. It can be really hard to know what to do. And I really like Camilla's solution. I think it was good. Here's something I have that other people probably need. And here's a way that I could reach out and help. I'm not saying that means, you know, the take home here is everyone should be like Camilla and teach English as a second language class. But I think we all have something somebody different than us needs and figuring out how to give that away is kind of world changing for all of us. I've been on the giving and receiving side of that. I, I think what I'm saying is a true statement. Yeah, for me, it's all about that quote I heard Michelle Obama say, it's hard to hate up close. And so these issues that we talk about often, they, they have names and faces, mm -hmm. don't they? And they have struggles. <laughs> but it's easier to hate <laughs> because that's the thing. I was thinking today, like, if there's a political candidate right now, because you got, you know, we're coming up to election season and you have two different sides. Yay. <laughs> Yay. And these candidates hate each other and they, they want to, like, constantly throw mud at the other side. Yeah. What would it look like for a person to come up in the middle and be like, hey, I'm here. And uh, we're just going to try to be cool. It would be hard to rally support behind the middle moderation. Oh, or, I... Or the middle moderate. That'd be hard to get a bunch of support for. Ready for the tinfoil hat, homie? Bring it. I think people want it. I think people would gobble it up. 
I think the majority of people are in the middle of the distribution and would be like, yes, thank you. Kindness, common sense, not certainty on everything. Like, well, I'm not quite sure what I think about this. I guess I'd want to gather people around me who see it from different angles and try to figure out the best way to do the most good for the most people and not be concerned about who gets credit for the win. People want that. People want that tone. People want people who compliment their enemy and show care and concern for their enemy. People want someone who would govern from a perspective of deep consideration for people who didn't vote for them. I think there's stuff going on beyond what we understand, and I have all kinds of theories about what that might look like or who motivates it. But I see patterns in how media and coverage and the game works, and it's not entirely just paranoia. I mean, even stuff that we've seen from, you know, come out about the 26 campaign that is fully above board and vetted indicates that, nope, there are invisible actors in this thing. I don't think it benefits the powerful for us to rally behind someone who's nice and reasonable. I think it benefits the powerful for us to hate each other and want to cannibalize each other. And I think an elite group of people who are completely off any kind of nonsense left-right spectrum I think a powerful group of people have figured out how to agitate us against each other for the benefit of a tiny minority of society. And I, I think we're suckers for it and I've fallen for it too. And so I, I think a candidate like that is what we want, but I think there are forces in play that make us unable to observe or understand or listen to or rally behind such a candidate unless something really freakish were to happen. Tinfoil hat off. I'd like to amend one thing about what you were saying. You said the powerful several times. And I would like to bring up the fact that there are multiple types of power. And so there's not just one group of powerful people and they're out to do bad things, you know, because I've been in those rooms. I've been in the rooms of the powerful on both sides of the aisle. You and I, when we left the White House that time and we were talking to people in the White House, and you remember what you said. You were like, hey, they want the same things I want. Their ideas are just a little bit different than mine. Well, yeah, and the key difference is there, the people we talked to there who were all wonderful, they have an enormous amount of optimism, not about individuals, but individuals coming together in government. And I have skepticism about what happens when you put everybody together with that kind of power. But what was interesting is we really did agree on what we wanted. Like stability, not war, prosperity for everybody, some kind of increase in civility. (laughs) Everything they said is what I want. I have a little different plan for how to get it done. I I loved that visit. Did I tell you about, I think I did. There was a group of people from up north in Columbia University in New York. They came down and studied my city. Did I tell you this? Yeah, you told me about the meeting. Is it okay to talk about the meeting? I don't know if it's okay to talk about the meeting. Okay. Long story short, I don't know if it's okay or not, but a professor brought a group of business students from an Ivy League college down to my little town in Alabama, and there was a a panel of people talking with them, and they were asking all kinds of hard questions because they realized that their policies that they were making when they got out of these high-octane business schools were affecting people in middle America. So they went to all these different cities. They went to some cities in middle America that were shrinking as a result of certain industries being moved away from the U.S. And they they went to some cities like where I'm from, and they studied the people here, first of all, the culture, you know, the faiths or or lack of faiths in certain areas, and Mm -hmm. they just figured out what makes these people tick and how does a policy that's created in New York or D.C., How does it affect people in different places? It was a fascinating study, absolutely fascinating. And so they gathered a bunch of people in a room and just asked questions. There was a black pastor up there. There was the police chief in my city who's black. There was a couple of white pastors up there, and they were all talking, and they're all buddies. And these people were asking them questions about how the local industry and things like that worked and what's it like to you know, in your congregation, these people think these certain things politically. And it was amazing to see the questions that came out once they realized that 
the things that people believed were not tied to political things. Like they kind of thought conservatism and faith were the same thing. Hmm. And they thought that, well, if you look like this and you talk like this and you live in a certain area, then you obviously support this kind of politics. My pastor said some things that was very eye-opening to these people, and it was actually backwards from what they thought. <laughs> I wish I could talk about it more. Maybe we should have Steve on sometime and let him talk about it. I would love to have Steve on sometime and just talk about Alabama and what he's doing, what he's going for. He's a different cat. Steve, we know you listen. <laughs> yep. Message sent. Shot across bow. Yep. So if I'm hearing everything right. Yeah. You flew on a plane, a plane that flies in one atmosphere. Yep. And you went to Chicago where you hung out with Don Pettit and Emily Grassley, both of our friends. And then Don talked to you about a Quackamenstra Don and how it flew in 3.2 atmospheres and how that would be different, which caused me to think about <laughs> dream flying. And then after you slept a good night's sleep and had dreams, you got up and then you got in a cab and you recorded this amazing conversation that got you to thinking about everything, about how people relate and what's going on with the degree of difficulty we deal with in this country versus other parts of the world and the heartbreak of betrayal and hurt that comes with living in both a difficult and beautiful time and how a lot of that has to just do with perspective. And it got you to thinking more about outsiders and people from different situations and what you can do and what you can be to respond to that with grace and in a different way. And then, I don't know, there's some fart jokes in there or something too. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Wait, maybe there were no fart jokes this time. <laughs> <sighs> people are going to quit listening. So a lot of people ask me what podcast I listen to. And I've got Jordan Harbinger here on the phone. And dude, you have an amazing podcast. I mean, how do you get all these people on your show? You know, I used to go and try to be like, I need to figure out all these connections. But what happened was I realized when I'm interested in something, my audience is interested in something. So when I got pitched a book about sand, everybody on the team was kind of like, what? And I went, trust me, this could be good. So I read this book, The World in a Grain, about how sand transformed civilization. And I didn't know any of this, but basically civilization as we know it could not exist. We use it to make concrete, glass, asphalt, silicone chips and laptops, smartphones, everything. Sorry to interrupt you, but you opened me up to an entire, like, there's a sand mafia. That's crazy. So like, this was my introduction to your podcast and I've devoured several episodes since then, but this was fascinating. So who is this guy and what did he investigate? So Vince Beiser, he went and decided to write a book about sand and he's like, yeah, it's so interesting. Sand, we need so much of it. Let's do this. And then he started to research sand and there are sand pirates that will go to places that have good sand and they'll steal it. And a lot of the sand that you would find on the beach is actually really good sand. But here's the problem. The sand that's under there is not. So they will go and take sand away from the beach, which makes erosion happen. It makes people's houses fall into the ocean. They'll go and dig up farmland because there's good sand underneath it. And then people can't grow food. And then people say, hey, you can't dig up my whole city and take the sand. And then they're like, well, there's one way to get rid of that guy, right? And take the sand and sell it. So they get rid of him. And it's just this crazy situation in which desert sand does not work. You can't just go to Dubai and be like, look, we have an ocean of this stuff. That stuff, unfortunately, is too round, among other reasons. Yeah, it's been eroded by the wind, if I understand correctly. Correct. And so like in concrete, you have different things that come together to combine it. And the aggregate is very important. And if you don't have those sharp edges for the cement to grab onto, it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. I had never thought about that, but I've like studied fracture mechanics at the, you know, in school. But once you said it, I was like, of course it matters. So thank you for teaching me about engineering. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Never thought I would so, do that. So here's what we're going to do. If, if it's cool with you, man, I would like to link to that particular episode in the show notes, and people can just go check out your podcast and see what they think. I'd love that. It's episode 97 with Vince Beiser, Why Sand is More Important Than You Think, and uh, that's on the Jordan Harbinger Show. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so what this whole conversation has done for me is solidified the book that I want to pick for our next book discussion. Okay. Can I, can I announce that now? Yeah, 
Well, yeah, what's it going to be? Because it's an announcement. I don't want to give you the impression I'm asking and that you get some sort of like input or something. It's not that. <laughs> okay, I'm game. What's it going to be? It's a short book. It's available on Audible. It's called True Grit, and it's by Charles Portis. You've probably Isn't seen the movie. Isn't it a cowboy book? It is a cowboy book. This was a John Wayne movie, right? It was a John Wayne movie. And about eight years ago, it was remade. And it's a book that has one enormously powerful pronounced theme that I would like to talk about together. And I think I'd like to recommend a complimentary book and or movie to go along with it to add to the conversation. Am I allowed to do that? It just depends. Like when you talk about an enormous scene, like there can be some pretty powerful scenes. Did I ever tell you about the the time I gave my son where the red fern grows? <laughs> no, but I sure I remember him where, the, where the red fern grows. I gave him where the red fern grows. And uh, I was like, hey, here's a good book about dogs. You'll like this, buddy. Oh, and I walk upstairs. On, man. And he is a puddle. He's oh. like snot. He's, oh. like, he's like, dad, what have you done? I take back I like, a lot hey, of man. the nice things I've said about you in the past. Welcome to adulthood, buddy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I did not say that. Freaking monster. <laughs> so there's, so to be clear, there's not a scene in the book like that, right? Uh, uh, it's different than that. The themes are, are different than that. What about Old Yeller? Is there a scene in there like Old Yeller? No, it's got a little different feel. It's this is a What little... about Deliverance? Is it like Deliverance? Wow. Uh, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we'll so get there eventually. <laughs> I'm just giving you the the movies that have scarred me. Okay. So am I going to be scarred at the end of this? Maybe a little bit, but in good ways. Because it's the kind of scar that if if a book like this inflicts it in its brief, whatever it is, six hour runtime, then where that scar heals up is actually better than it was before because it changes you in a good way. Okay, good. I'm game. True Grit by who? Uh, By Charles Portis, not Clinton Portis, the longtime NFL running back with a neck twice the thickness of his head because the guy was just a beast. He must have done like traps day every single day. But Charles <laughs> Portis, totally different. Charles Portis. Looking forward to it. And what movie goes along with it? I want people to watch the Jim Caviezel Count of Monte Cristo, the one that had Guy Pierce in it alongside Jim Caviezel. Did you ever see it? Oh, so this is a different movie than the book. Yeah. Yeah, you can... You I can don't, think- don't Don't cheat and go watch the movie of True Grit. It's not the same. Read the book. Okay. But then the complimentary movie that factors into the discussion and adds some fun and variety to this whole thing is that the 20-year-old Count of Monte Cristo. Okay. Probably came out in, like, I don't know, maybe 02 or something like that. I've seen one scene from it. Okay. So, okay. I'm game. All right, good. There will be one word that will be the topic for the episode where we discuss these things. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be fun. All right. Sweet, man. I appreciate it. It was fun to squeeze this in, dude. It was nice to catch up. We haven't talked, have we? We've talked- We have not. Some business stuff and some logistics stuff, but seriously, you told me like four or five things that we just haven't connected on. I think we've been busy. It really was nice to have to carve out a couple of hours to just catch up and talk about stuff. Thanks. Yeah, man. I enjoyed it. Cool. I'm going to go do this take-home exam, dude. It is time. Uh, I'm going to go edit frantically to get things out tomorrow. So sounds like we're sort of in the same boat. Let's both go pass tests. Sweet. All right. Have a good one, buddy. Later, buddy.